Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Beverly Hills View. Our guest, Tony Berlant, was born in New York City and raised in California. He earned a BA and MA in painting and sculpture at UCLA. His work has been included in major museums throughout the United States. Many of those same museums own the work of Berlant, as do many of our Beverly Hills residents. Tony was the recipient of the LACMA New Talent Award and received a Ford Foundation Purchase Award. He's known for his unique style in metal collage. And we have one of the pieces on the set, and we're going to go in close so you can see what his uh, brush stroke is, how he uses the nails, and the imagery on his various pieces of work. So, hi, Tony. Hey, Joan. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> and also, I've always wanted to ask you, why did you want to become an artist? Well, I think it's difficult even now to declare yourself as an artist. It's funny, so isn't I, it? <laughs> oh, yeah, because what does it mean? I and And I, because uh, if you say you're a painter or a collage maker, it's very specific. But if you say you're an artist, it's like saying I'm a professional visionary. You know, it makes big claims, just the word artist. Ah. And so what were you going to do? Well, I, I, art history. I was always, I loved making things. And uh, art history seemed like a reasonable thing to say you were going to do. So I started out with that. But then, ironically, as the decades went by, I did do various uh, things that can be thought of as art historical but, projects. But were, did you go to, to uh, high school here? I went to Culver City High. Oh, and did you start? Were you making art then? Yeah, as a senior, when you're when the courses you took were not going to be transferred on your <laughs> right. uh, applications anymore, so you could do anything. So what were you doing? Painting? I was making. Uh, I was painting. I was making collages. Oh, and, you were. Yeah, I was. So why did you choose UCLA, even though it was really close to Culver City? Well, UCLA was the main, uh, it had wonderful art department and great people teaching, because this is a time when even celebrated artists couldn't make a living making their work. So I had Diebenkorn for beginning painting, and uh, there were heroes of mine. They weren't just anonymous teachers or people whose work I had admired in high school. So you knew those teachers. You I knew, knew who work. they were. You knew the them. work. Who else was in that department? Well, Bill Bryce was the chairman, oh, oh. very sophisticated guy, really? uh, and very supportive. And then all kinds of people came, like Alan Jones, uh, for instance, who we were talking about. You know, we were talking about, you were talking about the time when you couldn't make a living as an artist, so to speak, so people would teach. But there's always been like this stigma on teachers that they don't become fine artists. Is there some, some mix there? Well, there was, a, I think that people manage to be proud of what they do in the arts. There might be a stigma with other people. I don't was, mean stigma, I meant a way that no, they sure, say he's teaching. No, sure, it was meant you couldn't make a living as an artist. And yeah. you weren't prepared to take the risk and be poor. Thank you. Uh, you could live <laughs> comfortable, and uh, so they, were they taken seriously as artists then? Yeah, I don't think there was any because among artists. I don't think there was anything that was uh, if you weren't born rich, if you didn't marry somebody with yeah. money. Uh, teaching seemed like the least uh, distorting job you could have. Because if you talk about Dick. Diebenkorn, I mean, he certainly did make a living as an artist, and he had a studio, and he was very well thought of. Oh, he was totally celebrated, but I don't think he was making enough money to oh, live without I see, I see, uh, I see, teaching, I see. not at all. So you went back to UCLA to teach. Yeah, I was very happy. To How did you get that gig? Well, just that they, they really liked me, and they said, uh, you have to go away somewhere and teach for a year, and I went to a terrible little place, American River Junior College in Sacramento. Oh, you did? Which I didn't realize was only one of two schools blacklisted by uh, the American Teachers Association until I uh, showed up. And then there was a very interesting group uh, of people. Wayne Debo lived 
Oh, the, all the San Francisco right artists there. were there? No, this was in Sacramento. Oh, I mean in Sacramento, yeah. Yeah, and Mel Ramos was a couple blocks oh, away. Oh, wow. Everybody came in uh, from San Francisco to uh, teach in uh, Psych uh, University of California, Davis. Oh. It was a very, as it is now, a very fluid kind of world, the art world. Well, Sacramento, that was great. No one thinks about it as being a like a mecca for artists, but as you said, Ramos and Well, it was, it was because uh, Wayne Tebow was the head of the department. And he's still he's, there playing tennis every day. He's, he's out still in his playing 90s. playing tennis every day in his 90s. I know. And he uh, brought all kinds of really interesting people in. To, to that area. Yeah, and, they, and most of them were people who lived in San Francisco. Who it's could interesting just drive because... In. That was that was the center of our California Arts Council, and we would and I would go up when I was serving on the council yeah. to have meetings up there, and we would have different artists come in, but mostly they would come from San Francisco, and and Davis yeah. surrounding areas. Um, Joan Didion was writing out of Sac uh, Sacramento, mm -hmm. so it was a pretty early cultural hub. Yeah, I didn't realize that. So what were you teaching? Whatever the uh, <laughs> senior staff didn't want to teach. <laughs> and so, then, and so then even you though I didn't draw, I taught all these drawing courses. Oh please! So then you came down to UCLA and were able to teach. They were. I, they hired me back when I left. They said, "If you go teach somewhere for a year, we'll hire you back." So. And so, what form was your artwork taking when you were at UCLA? Oh, I was already making, exhibiting, and making the collage things. I did particularly. The portraits of uh, young women I knew, tracing them and using their clothes to make collages. And using their clothes because that was one of the first pieces that I bought. It was called tangerine. Was it tangerine or the one with the dress on it? Yes. Because the LACMA, the LA County Museum, had a rental gallery, and I went and I was. Uh, volunteering my time at the rental yeah. gallery and I was seeing what was coming in and there were two of your pieces there yeah. and we bought them early on in the 60s. Well, uh, yes, it's strange that this little corridor in the basement basically. It was, uh, but, was but it was a collage place. in a way, right? Yeah. Well, it was the one place uh, there, uh, where you could go and see most of the people who are now celebrated uh, in Los Angeles. And, and was it on, it's on canvas? Uh, it's on plywood. Oh, it's on plywood. Yeah, but so it's, it's my canvas. But you're, ca so, so do you ever use canvas just per se, or is it always wood? No, I don't think I ever, once I was done being an undergraduate at UCLA, I don't think I ever worked on stretched canvas. <laughs> so here we are, you're teaching at UCLA, you're a young artist, you get, the Young Talent Award at LACMA. Right. That was when they were giving that award, which was a great award. It was like emerging artists, right? Young talent. Yeah, I was the second year. Here you are on the screen. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, there I am with the first painting I ever painted. Is that right? Yes. And you won the award with that? No, but I did get into the uh, Artists of LA and Vicinity show with that piece. And, and, what was the subject of that? Just uh, self-grandizement. You know. <laughs> it was, uh, but it was very. It, when you art is so subjective, and as soon as you get the approval of people you admire or some external feedback, it's very much a green light. It's important. But did, was it important to you? Could oh, you yeah. feel it? Oh yeah. yeah. It so, still is. <laughs> still, is. so as a historian, you wanted to be a historian, maybe this led to your collecting of Southwest artifacts. Did yeah, I just think I always was uh, directed towards being a, a collector, including a collector of tin. You know, it's a matter of oh. bringing all kinds of stuff together from different sources but talk, and then free talk associating about, with it. Talk about the artifacts, the Navajo blankets and um, the Mimbris pots. Yeah, well, I was very uh, attracted to American Indian art, mainly because uh, no one was very interested in it. The things didn't, essentially didn't cost anything. And uh, I loved African art and other things that were already being 
uh, collected, so I focused on American Indian things from the Southwest primarily. Uh, and that was really uh, exciting to do because that, these things hadn't received exposure and I was able to do primary first exhibitions and publications. Well, you did first, you did a great exhibition at LACMA um, year 2019 and it was a fantastic installation. Tell, tell us how that was. How the installation the, this took This part. is the Membrane Ceramic installation? Yes, yes. Yeah, these are uh, a great painting tradition in the 12th century in uh, New Mexico, southern New Mexico. And uh, at a certain point, I came to understand that they were all depictions of Datura, this hallucinogen. And uh, uh, I suddenly understood what, what all the iconography meant. It was all from the hallucinogen. It w they were plants, right? Well, Datura is the most used hallucinogen in the world and it grows all over the Southwest. Uh, well, lots of plants, right. Yeah. Yeah. And they were using that to get into a vision uh, state. But it still doesn't explain why in a particular little culture of maybe 6,000 people, such uh, refinement and development uh, took place. It's always the mystery of why in certain places, at certain moments, fantastic art happens, and it doesn't often endure forever. So I think you brought this love of your Southwest, your Navajo blankets, the members, to other artists, because I think your friends became very interested in that time too, that time frame. Well, I remember in high school realizing that the only thing I was really great at was show and tell, <laughs> you know? And I love to do that, and particularly with uh, artists whose work I very much uh, respected in New York. So right away I was selling things to uh, all the usual people from Warhol to Johns to Rauschenberg to David Norros to Bryce Moore, everybody basically. So Andy, that's where Andy probably learned about when he collected Indian baskets and he collected all kinds of Southwest yeah. things, but he was buying from you at that time. Yeah, no, he did, but he was also a voracious, as you know, Collect, buyer and yeah. find something that other people didn't want, like cookie jars. Yeah, And exactly. he'd really land on them ferociously. But how did you know Andy? Oh, he was, as you remember, everybody <laughs> knew everybody and everybody met everybody. And Oldenburg introduced me to Warhol and brought him to my studio. And Klaus introduced him as a buyer. Oh, oh, and here he said, came. Oh, but he does, and also he makes things. And he makes art, right? He makes things, yeah. <laughs> If you, you, I know you knew him from the very beginning. I did, I did, and I knew that he also was a great collector, like you said. And I, and he, he had blankets, lots of and them. And he was an appreciator of uh, other artists in, in a very unusual way. Uh, and I would, uh, on several occasions, would go around and look at shows of uh, artists, and he would look for people who he thought he would be good to hire. Oh, right. To make his work <laughs> right. under, his, under his direction. To make his work, exactly. Yeah, under, but he was always open to everybody and everything. Do you think that, that the images or the, uh, the texture of the blankets or anything from that, the plants, um, had an influence on your collages? Well, everything influences everybody. I mean, it's hard to, one usually points to the most obvious yeah. uh, things, but there's all kinds of things that uh, influence people. But the biggest influence was just people working here who uh, I deeply admired from the time I was in high school. Keenholz and Billy Al Bigston, uh, Ed Moses, and the whole Ferris group who later became very close friends. So you, they were already showing, and oh, you yeah, were, were, yeah, you were the next younger generation down, yeah, really. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And I know you were friends with that whole group, and I think it was because there was a respect for your work. It was totally different. Everyone working at that time seemed to be working in a different media, 
and they were all working together. Larry Bell was in glass. Moses was painting. Billy was watercoloring, lots of watercolors. Yeah. Um, and you were doing this kind of... Uh, well, and Billy was doing the spray point. Oh, spray, paint. right, exactly. Uh, uh, in, uh, and dentos and working with tin. Yeah, and but everybody was very distinctive and individual. And yes, Ruche was putting words on. Joe Good was using uh, milk bottles and stairways. People did claim a particular It's funny, thing. but you guys were all friends. I think people were very friendly because whatever the differences were with people, we were still very bound to each other in terms of our commitment. And we were famous with each other. We, you agreed, were <laughs> That's we a, agreed to be famous with each other. That's a good way to say it. So yeah. let's talk about um, what an, what initially and what finally became what you were famous for, which seems to be tin on wood. Yeah, well, metal collage. Metal collage. I mean, okay, I don't talk even, about I'm it. What? I'm kind of shocked to say it like that because I don't think of it that way. But yes, that's what it is. Uh, so where you were collecting tin? Why were you collecting tin? Well, I was just attracted to it, you know. <laughs> Trays and, and what was TVs, it? Oh, uh, um, trays and advertising signs. And, I see. But, but it was all things that uh, I was interested in. And at that time, a lot of people that I admired were not really painters or sculptors. They were making objects. It was a different and time, right? And that started right? with like Cornell as a hero of mine. Who? Cornell. Joseph oh, right, Cornell, making boxes. Yeah, who I didn't really know except for brief encounters. I see. Rauschenberg and Johns, oh, right. Louis Nevelson, everybody would pick a kind of material that they identified with oh. and uh, make, make their art with, with that identity. Oh. So it wasn't painting and it wasn't sculpture. It was, uh, they were, we were object makers. I see, I see. So, so how did you get the, the form? What started first? Was it a farm? Was it a box? Well, the little house. I found a little birdhouse somewhere and thought it was so evocative and covered it with tin. So, so this image took house. covered it. How'd you cover well, it? Well, the with house tin? is such a basic icon. Right. You know, it stands for me for the self and for every the little world we all make within the bigger world. And so it and and it was a form between painting and sculpture. You couldn't see it all at once. You have to move it around, and it keeps revealing things. And then you might see the, oh, the you bottom. Might. You know, there was no top, really. There was no bottom. So you built, then you started with a regular uh, birdhouse. Only one. And then you started then building these. The then did you build these? Yeah. And the house is the little house, like the house on a Monopoly uh, oh, the thing. Right, it's yeah. like the icon. But you made the them all different. The most icon. Yeah, different sizes. Yeah, I made them from finally 15 feet high to, and we'll, we'll see some images of those the big huge, things in yeah. the 60s. From the, is this the smallest size that we have here? Yeah. So yeah. so what would you do? You start with a wooden box, and then what? what's the next Well, it's thing? just free associating, looking at the, I usually, uh, I'm not somebody who's usually, particularly at that time, worked with an image in advance of what I was going to do. It was a series of free associations. But the house was this uh, basic format, like the rectangle in uh, painting. And uh, as the years uh, went by, I came to understand that the rectangle wasn't just a cultural uh, convention, that the, the brain loves the rectangle. The human brain loves the rectangle. And what it likes even better than a rectangle is a rectangle that's been tweaked in some way that's kind of ambiguous, that can be interpreted in different ways. And so all the, these things that just seem like cultural conventions come out of neurological uh, predispositions. So I see little pieces on here. So one of your tools must be a tin cutter. Yeah, I use very simple tools, just a uh, tin snips, a hammer, nails, a little punch, <laughs> band-aids. Oh, a punch. Yeah. Ah, band-aids for your fingers? Yeah. <laughs> and you you sit, do you just sit like at a, a, like a cobbler's bench or at a table? That, it could be interpreted as a cobbler's bench. <laughs> sure. Is that, is that how you work? 
Yeah, a little thing in front of me, sure. And eventually, because tin, we don't use that much tin anymore, that kind of ran out. And then you started printing your own material. Well, I made material. I went to the factories where printed things were made. And when I would go through their trash, they would get curious <laughs> and come out and, what are you doing? And then one place, uh, Western Metal Decora Decorating in Cucamonga, uh, invited me into the factory and allowed me to take whatever I wanted. And then eventually allowed oh. me to print things there. Oh, is so, that what? Yeah, so I was using found tin that was already been made and I was fabricating. And I still do something along those lines. So, yeah. But those are actually um, premeditated, where the other pieces of tin were just whatever the you could find. The imagery was, but yeah. how it was cut up and how it was. Now it's premeditated, the Well, imagery? making that part was premeditated, but cutting it up and rearranging it. That's different. Uh, was it? yeah. You, you, um, we're going to show a few pictures um, on the screen of some of your work, but uh, how long does it take to make a piece? It just depends on uh, how willing the uh, muses are. I mean, it's part of what's so interesting about making things is it can happen right away. It can take years. If something isn't sold and it comes back even after it's been exhibited, if it's been published, that's always a... Like these, well, this piece, yeah, we're showing... Yeah, it's like a bit of a... Uh, uh, this is a view uh, from my desk into the backyard at my house, but it's been... Rorschach, it's been uh, symmetricized yeah, you know, of a but tree. But it's all tin, these are all? Well, this is, these are, uh, yes, they're all tin. The photographic images are printed over the tin. This image of me is a picture uh, that Warhol took of me uh, when I was a young thing. The only photograph I ever made of me with my shirt off. And, uh, so and recently I found it and did it be, uh, because of the shock of seeing an image of yourself young. But this is a different image. This is a different thing than we've been talking about. This has an image on, this, on, the, tin. on the wood, on the tin, oh, on the tin. Yeah, it's all tin. And then you collaged on top yeah, of it? Yeah, right. Oh, I see. So there's no wood left. I see, and this usually. one's something like this? Yeah, and this is an image of my wife, Helen. Fabulous, yeah. beautiful. And the, and the, uh, the black design all over is a Spanish montilla that had belonged to her mother uh, that I used the design from. I think we got we have a little bit more of an idea of what you were doing. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back because you did this whole series of big houses in France when you worked with Frank Gehry and we'll talk about some other things. Good. We'll be right back. Bye-bye. Hi. Hoping for a crisp breeze to help keep you alert. Oh, oh, he took a sip of water, too. That'll probably help. You were probably going to turn down the radio, too, so you could focus, right? Probably OK isn't OK. Right? If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. I think the water line is what really drove it home. I blew on him. They're coming. Please, is everybody. Light check. One, two, one, two. Everything looks good on our end. And lights. Come alive with the forest. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Queen is just my everything. His smile did it. His smile, his eyes, his knowledge. My landlord, he decided that he wanted me to move based on the fact that I was transgender. Let's just respect people in everyday life for just being human. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome back to the Beverly Hills View. I'm talking to artist Tony Berlant, and we're, 
we mentioned his work, we talked about the tin, we talked about the houses, but he's also mentioned along with Joe Good and Larry Bell and Ed Ruscha as nurturing the aesthetic sensibility of West Coast pop art movement. And what is that? What, what aesthetic is that? Well, it's always named after the fact. <laughs> oh, you know, okay. people are not calculating. They just uh, don't uh, suppress impulses. And because they're coming out of the same culture at the same time, there's a kind of overlap that's very specific. And often the earliest work is the best because there's a certain point it starts getting uh, a personally uh, repetitive decision. Right, and we did talk about what those artists did. That's right, and that was part of the aesthetic, I guess, that we mentioned when we said they were all doing different things, but, but friendly. Very friendly. Yeah. Let me tell you one thing. I mean, friendly the way siblings. Yeah, are, Biden. Are, is beyond <laughs> friendship right. And the hostilities and the competitions <laughs> are part of the love uh, complex. I, I mentioned uh, a group of artists, but Via Selmans was not mentioned in that, and she was part of that pop culture. Well, movement. I was very close to Via. So tell us Via a little was, bit. Why wasn't she involved uh, in, like, thought of as that part of the group? Well, I think that Via didn't, as a woman artist, didn't feel that she was uh, the equal of men. She felt that she was superior to oh, everybody. Oh, superior. To everybody. <laughs> and I remember uh, Bob Irwin, who we were both <laughs> nominally students of, saying uh, uh, Via has perfect taste. She doesn't like anything. That's so great because that's her personality, and that's isn't still it? Still via. It's still via, and she's a terrific artist, and she's she a great did artist. paint what she saw in her studio, which was all what we call now pop art, right? Yeah, I mean, Via way. would never consider herself a pop artist. No, but, uh, none of the people. Yeah, it you know it was a phrase that came along. But I remember Oldenburg telling me this pop art. Thing is really going to be big. Oh, he did yeah, say and, that. And uh, you should come to New York because otherwise she'll just be passed over by history. But you didn't go to New York. But Via went to New York. Via went to New York, but Via did became totally uh, a mature artist in all of her signature aspects before she went to New York. Do you still hang out with artists? Oh, sure. Those that are alive. I mean, it's one of the very sad things is to have the community, of course, naturally uh, die off. And because I was so precocious, I was friends with a lot of people who oh. were 10 to 20 years older. Yeah, than that myself. was great. Um, we took a trip to Marfa and, of course, uh, Texas, and you knew Donald Judd very well and, mm -hmm. and some of the other artists who were showing there, some who were gone, um, a lot who were gone. Of course, that's what happens. Yeah. It's a shock to come to realize that people die. That's Ta Well, that's talk what about they do. Marfa a little bit because you, you gave a lecture there. and. Well, I knew uh, uh, Donald Judd was interested in all kinds of art and all kinds of things. And uh, uh, he, uh, when I was complaining about teaching one day when I had lunch with Donald and Stella, and he said, well, come to New York and bring a bunch of blankets and <laughs> stay with me and uh, we'll, we'll buy them. You don't have to be a teacher. And uh, Judd was first and he bought like eight blankets. This is the first time I ever sold anything. And then... Uh, and because you had such an abundance or were you Well, because I was a fanatic collector. That's what it was, and, okay. And okay. I had all these things. <laughs> yeah, and, okay. Uh, I would sell the ones that I didn't absolutely feel I had to keep. I but see. also these artists were heroes of mine. And so so I Judd very much said enjoyed, come. Uh, uh, and he had a studio. Yeah, Judd had, had a studio in Soho, had the building, right? It was a, He bought a building that was supposed to be torn down for the West Side Highway. And oh, right. I happened to arrive in New York the first time the day that the, that was ruled out. Oh, so it that was, was very, good. It was very memorable. Yeah. But uh, after uh, uh, Donald bought his uh, eight, Stella came and he just waved at the room, which was 
covered with blankets. He said, I'll take everything else. Frank Stella did? Yeah, yeah. Did I think he? there were 32 of them. Did he? Yeah, so for me it was it was more than business. It was uh, interaction yeah. and a uh, an approval uh, by of the things I love, by the people whose work I love. And so, and then Donald um, took over this big area in Marfa, and which was, uh, had, had been buildings on it, it had been Air Force Base, and there were buildings on it, and he has... Uh, he bought the town for back taxes, basically, is what he told me. That's what he, but the wonderful buildings with great art in them. Oh, yeah. Well, he was a fantastic collector, and also he had this vision very early of putting all of this together and doing it. Had to be a kind of egomaniac to, to well, do it. T talking about your involvement with artists, you also were involved with Frank Gehry, who's a star architect, architect, who's also one of the friends of all of our friends, is a, is a friend of all of our friends, all of those artists that we talked about. He was, to me, I always thought Frank wanted to be one of you guys. He wanted well, he, to be an artist. Well, he was. He did insist on being an artist. He did insist on it, and he became an artist, right, in his field. He became totally, arguably, the most important artist to ever come out of Los Angeles, and uh, totally admiring of everybody's work when nobody was much except yourself and Jack. And right. I mean, I think that's why I said it's a very small familial group of people who reinforced each other and and uh, uh, you and Jack did things for us just out of love and liking being with us. It was I a love it. Familial, I love familial uh, situation. Because we were it was it was like small town and it was friends and and it was really great I think the story is you had one of Jack's old Cadillacs years ago. Well you gave me you and Jack <laughs> Because I was driving a little gremlin, <laughs> and uh, Bengston told me no one would ever take me seriously <laughs> if I drove a gremlin. The L.A. Uh, Ferris crowd were very involved with their cars, and so uh, right. uh, uh, Jack uh, called me up and said not only was the gremlin a no-style thing, but it was dangerous. Dangerous. That's what uh, yeah. he would worry about. Yeah, yeah. and so I took the, uh, one of your Coupe de Ville's which you said had only been driven to society luncheons and had 16,000 <laughs> miles on it. But then when it broke down, it. what happened? I'm sorry? When it broke down. Well, finally, then you had another Cadillac. <laughs> but that, did that you I just leave it at the side it. of the road somewhere? No, it got passed on to my <laughs> assistant. Oh, it got passed on. So uh, Frank was part of that group, part of that familial group. And... You did a big project with Frank. First of all, you made these huge houses that you were talking about, 14 feet and, and I guess smaller, maybe six feet, and filled them with, there's one with the Cavern of Women and some, some of the small ones you put neons in them, and there's one with baseball people. Yeah. Well, I, that house image is, I, I'm still involved with. Uh, and. Uh, but tell us what, what the project It could be something to be proud of or something to be embarrassed no, about. No, I think they're uh, great. Tell us about the, the project with Frank because it's well, a big Well, the project with Frank or, and, uh, uh, or that he brought you to in France. Yeah, but it, it really came about because uh, uh, Frank uh, oh, took these temple sculptures that I made, which were like Greek temples with skyscrapers in them, and he set them up in his studio. Oh, right. And uh, they worked around them and pinned their drawings up on my sculpture. And uh, uh, gradually, years later, when Patty McKillen, uh, at, uh, who established Chateau Lacoste, which is a great uh, That's where sculpture that center, uh, uh, Frank had agreed to make these structures for them. Oh, so they're in structures? They're in the Frank Gehry structures. That oh, he let's go them. through and see those again yeah. and let yeah. let Tony talk yeah. about them. Yeah. So you so you come upon them out in the woods, and then there are these uh, stairs that Frank made. So you climb up the stairs and look at them up close. Ah. But but it's a kind of uh, I always wanted them to be a kind of shrine, not just a sculpture. Like this. How far and they from are a shrine. how far from Paris is that? 
Well, this is uh, just out, half an hour outside of Aix-Provence. Oh, it's in Aix-Provence. Yeah, it's just outside. And is Beautiful it gonna, is it permanent? Will it be there oh, yeah. all the time? Yeah, Patty uh, has this big sculpture park that keeps evolving and changing. It's so beautiful. Who else is in that park? Oh, it's just everybody. I mean, like... <laughs> just make a list of everybody who does sculpture. Uh, is that Richard where... Serra is right next to this. Richard Serra? Yeah. I mean, it, it's a... But rather than being kind of like a parking lot collection where you go out and buy things and line them up like a fancy car parking lot, uh, Patty had people come to X, go to the place, and walk around and find a location and come up with an idea. So it was. So it's like site specific? Yeah, so they're very site specific. Very site specific. You have, um, your work was shown at LA Louvre in Santa Monica, and now it's shown at Michael Cohn Gallery right. in Hollywood. Yeah. And you did a series of blade signs. How did that. Weren't they blade signs? Yeah, well, you, you gave me that title. <laughs> I you loved told, them. You told me that in architecture, Right. Signs like that that stick out from the wall are called blade signs. Well, because and those interested me because like the houses, oh. you couldn't see it all at once. You saw one part and you went around. But also I like to hang them up high and have them be, uh, when you went in the room, even if they were small, uh, I like the kind of what is that? It didn't immediately fit into a category. Exactly. Well, well when I served on the Architectural Commission in Beverly Hills, we like those blade signs because as you're walking down the street, you can see them from both sides yeah. and it gives you a, a, a title of what's behind it, what the shop is. So when you were making them, I was like, oh, these blade signs are great. <laughs> well, you've always been, you and Jack were always totally supportive. And I might say that, uh, yes, you bought things from everybody at a very crucial time but you also provided a kind of social context for a whole community. And Jack was always there to get us out of trouble. I love that. You know, I know. He was so great. Care of things. And uh, oh. Keenholz introduced me to, to Jack. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy because the last time we were with Keenholz, he was in Berlin. And we were able to spend time with him yeah. then before. So, in closing. Yes. Um, we have pictures of uh, a Beverly Hills house. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to put it on the screen, and you can tell what that oh, is. Oh, that's your house. <laughs> yeah, that's an image. Uh, this is a door, as you know, that I made for you, Jack. And uh, one half is uh, this exterior vision of the house. Yes, and the and other side. And the other side, which we'll see in a minute, is uh, a more subjective interior uh, image but I like the idea that you can't see both things at once so when it's you see thing. one side the image and the memory of the other side is inseparable when you see the, the next side which is great because that's what your whole thing is about right your whole movement and yeah it was not it's not a, it was not a conscious program it was just uh, what was there <laughs> the impulse that uh, I was directed by God knows what to pursue. But I can see it talking today, I can see it more from everything we've mentioned, yeah. from the Southwest to uh, the artists that you worked with, to your to what you do, because it's all encompassing. It's like a circle. It's really interesting. Well, when interesting. we were in Marfa together for the, this event, and we went to the uh, Chamberlain Room, which is huge. Great. And Chamberlain was a big hero of mine when I was still in high school. Oh, and he used And I can see the similarity. I mean, after the fact, everybody feels they're completely unique. But after the fact, you can see that in each place, in each town, time, a vision uh, occurs that's collective. And, yes. That's uh, not uh, consciously arrived at, but is involuntarily... Uh, present in the work. And that's what I what I, I really same. was brought to today. So thank you, Tony. Thank you so much. I'm glad we're all still at it. I'm glad too, and I'm glad you watched the Beverly Hills View today. I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.